the panel, the discussion, an objective and impartial view of the issues of interest to you. Nation Beat is on now. And welcome to Nation Beat. In fact, it's a very special edition of Nation Beat as we are celebrating Emancipation 2024 and the Cultural Development Foundation in partnership with the Government Information Service has decided to put on a series of discourses, of panel discussions on the matter of emancipation, emancipating ourselves from mental slavery. We've heard that phrase quite often and throughout this series we're going to be analyzing some different issues with respect to this whole concept of emancipation within the 21st century. I'm the moderator for this series. My name is Calix George Jr. And our first panel discussion is actually on the role of young black males in overcoming the legacies of slavery and marginalization in modern St. Lucia. Young black males. And that, of course, has been quite topical for some time, the issues of gender. And to help us get through that conversation, to give insight and to provide some thoughts, we have a wonderful panel of young men and they of course are coming to us right here in studio as well as virtually from the diaspora first let me introduce the panel dr tennyson joseph is no stranger to saint lucia and of course he is a saint lucian academic uh formerly based at uh, the university of the west indies Kayville. he is now over in uh, north carolina i do believe where he is also lecturing there. Uh, of course, he has written a number of books. Uh, he has provided quite a lot of um, context on the post-colonial journey of St. Lucia, and he's a member of our panel tonight. Kevin Edmonds is a PhD student in political science, and uh, his research is focused on uh, the connection between trade liberalization, the decline of the banana trade, and the rise of marijuana cultivation in the Eastern Caribbean. And it's going to be a very interesting, uh, uh, of course, background there. He's also coming out of St. Lucia, out of the Mabria Valley area, but he'll, of course, tell us a lot more about himself and his journey in just a bit. Right here in studio with me is Mr. Nkrumah Lucien. He is a, also a University of West Indies grad. Uh, currently a teacher at the St. Mary's College, has a wide repertoire of uh, interests and of course has made contributions into many different uh, organizations including the uh, Alumni Association yes, of right. the Downstairs. University of the oh, West Indies. Okay. And as well, we uh, have Mr. Dr. Chevy Eugene. And uh, Chevy is in fact based over in Dalhousie University. He's a lecturer in Black and Africa, African Diaspora Studies, and uh, he is also uh, a PhD holder in doing research in decolonizing the Caribbean's communities, the Caribbean communities' reparations campaign. And of course, these gentlemen are going to give us quite a lot of insight into the matter at hand today. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're all very familiar with that uh, famous Calypsonian gypsy about little black boy go to school and learn. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, are hearing quite a lot about male underperformance uh, at the level of school, the issue of uh, use of drugs, uh, gang violence. It's all happening right about now. And, of course, the question is, are young black males really overcoming those legacies of slavery and marginalization today? And Kruva, you're right here in the studio with me. Maybe I'll allow you to have a first go at it. Okay, um, I just want to put some things on the table that if we are speaking about the effects of um, the legacy of slavery, yes, there may be direct impacts on the males, um, but then the males also exist in a, in a wider societal context. Um, which also manifests those effects. Um, so even as we look at how they might be responding, they are not, they are not responding necessarily to a society that, is, um, that has resolved its own issues where the legacy of slavery is concerned. So it is very relevant that we 
also look at that aspect of things. Um, what are the, <clears throat> the ideas of self in the society um, coming from that legacy? Uh, what are the ideas of morality, of order, and these things? Um, you have people like um, Dr. Martin Luther King, who speaks about the whole idea of peace and justice. Even um, the great Peter Tosh, we speak, he speaks about, do we want peace or do we want equal rights and justice? So it has to be a discussion that, yes, we are dealing with the issue of males. Um, most people in the society have not overcome the effects of enslavement. And we're talking black and black, Indian, white. Most people have not, but it would have impacted black males in a particular way. Um, but yes, I believe that the, this has to be discussed and reasoned out within the context of a society that is still resisting a lot of change where the legacy of slavery is concerned. Thanks very much for that, uh, Nkrumah. Uh, Tennyson Joseph, uh, you with us, I believe. And your view, is the young black male today at risk? Is it an endangered species? <laughs> well, it, it is broad in a sense, I'm just saying that it's an endangered species. What I would say is, and especially in the context of our current discussion, that what we are observing is a particular segment of our society, and I'm referring particularly to the violence and those that we are considered the ones that have been marginalized and we are losing in, in, the, in the broadest sense of the word, the, those who are engaged in activities that one might consider not the most productive or not the ones that, are so, that, that is at, at in the best interest of society as a whole, however, however defined, we can come to that. So not so much that, they are, that, that we have um, a case of extinction, but what, what we can do is identify a group of people, a particular subsector, a particular demographic, analyze where they are in society, at what point in their lives do they begin to manifest those tendencies that we consider um, um, undesirable, and what are the factors that, that make for them. And, I, and, and, in, and in that broad discussion, among the broad factors, one cannot, and, and, I, and I agree with Nkuma on that, one has to take into consideration the broad architectonic questions about the place of, of our society given our, his, our historical legacies of slavery and colonialism and how that, that is impacting on what you might call opportunity, how that, that might impact on what you might call images of self, what are the values, how you determine survival, how you determine success. And when you put all of those things in the mix, you can then identify in what ways are those, all of those factors impacting on that particular group in a, in a specific way. And what are the particular historical moments, the questions of materialism, what, what Nkrumah was calling um, a morality and so forth. How, do they, how does that particular demographic assess its sense of success, its values? How do I, or what do I consider a, success, a successful person? Mm -hmm. Who are my role models? And what, what are the routes via which one gets there? All of those questions are broad, broad questions, and a lot of them, or at least none of them, can, can be discussed outside of the context of the historical system that has brought us there. So I, I would say, based on that, to answer your question clearly, that there is a particular, it is not hard to do. Our sociologists, our statisticians, our, our social workers can actually give us the, the information on that, and we can identify which are the groups who, that the particular groups we, we discuss as being the ones at risk, we can, we can measure them clearly, analyze them clearly, look at the commonalities, look at their backgrounds, look at where they're from, look at their racial composition. We can do a number of things, and then we can then make some kind of informed discussion. And in doing that, I would say one cannot discount the historical legacy of slavery and colonialism in, 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 a, in bringing us to the situation in which we have found ourselves. That's the broadest way I, can, I, can, I think I can start off by answering your question, clearly. Mm. Thanks for that, uh, Dr. Joseph. And I want to go across to uh, Dr. Chevy Eugene, based in Dalhousie. Now, of course, we've heard those two gentlemen, uh, Chevy, and I'm, I'm still trying to get a sense uh, as to this issue as to are males, are young black males marginalized today in, in a St. Lucian context, in the Caribbean context? Your opinion on that? Um, first and foremost, thank you for having me on the show. Um, to answer that question, I think, I wouldn't think, 
Because if you're looking at history and the connection of transatlantic slavery to how it impacts our contemporary informed people everyday experiences, particularly young black men or particularly Caribbean men, Caribbean young men, I wouldn't say young men are marginalized. However, what, what I would say though, I think we need to untie it back to what uh, Dr. Tennyson mentioned. We need to redefine how we think about success, right? I know I'm coming, I, and I'll talk from a personal experience. I was born in St. Lucia, I went to RC Boys and did my did um, primary school, secondary school at entry post sec at entry post secondary school. And what played a what 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 helped me was the people around me, my family, right? My father, older male figures in my life that that helped me to think about success differently. And through my and I'm saying that to kind of give context of where I'm going next. And through my experience in post secondary education. I did not see a lot of um, young men, particularly in the, the courses that I was taking. It's not because um, they, they, they might not have access to university, but how do they think of post-secondary education? So when we're talking about marginalization, I think we have to redefine how we think about success and what young men are being attracted to and putting that back into, um, back into when we think about plantation or, or what Bell Hooks would call white supremacist capital patriarchy. The, how power is defined, access to power. For a lot of us young men growing up, I was saying, Marsha, we did not see power through education. We saw power through whether as drug dealing, having multiple women, and even the way we, we engage with women. So even when Nkuma mentioned about we cannot separate black men or male, male Caribbean men outside of a, a larger discourse, I think that's important as well. So it's how we redefine success and also think about how we, what we consider to be power. That's a very important point that you're making there. And perhaps it's a good opportunity to bring in uh, uh, Dr. Edmonds, Kevin Edmonds, into this conversation. Uh, because, Kevin, I understand, of course, you were doing some research on the whole rise of marijuana in the um, waning of the banana industry. Now, of course, that had a, a, perhaps a, a very bad connotation once upon a time. And we've seen how the whole world has shifted in that regard. Those points that are being made, the, the metrics are wrong, perhaps, in how we're actually looking at the contribution of young black males. Kevin. Again, thank you. I just want to uh, give my regards and thank you for organizing the panel and for inviting me on to take uh, part in the discussion. So in terms of that issue, I think that we can unpack a lot from the example of uh, you know, young black males growing ganja, how for the longest time it had been criminalized and, and to a degree it still is. I'm not pretending things are okay and we figured out um, the way to move forward within St. Lucia or the wider Caribbean or the world, but people moved into that space in order to actually find a way to survive in a very unforgiving system, right? A system where there was a lack of opportunity my family from the valley, I saw my cousins, my uncles, you know, basically thrown out of work, not overnight, but gradually. And what was left is people had to emigrate, those of us that did not leave. Um, some of us got jobs at resorts, some of us got jobs working at, you know, insurance companies or banks, some of them were in the government, but a lot of people that did not have an opportunity to go through the educational system they, they had to make ends meet so they could work construction part-time, work at the hotel during the season. But what do you do in the off time? You have to, to make ends meet. So people would go up into the hills and do that. There's that part-time, but there's also people that do that consistently. And I think they realize that this system is not set up in a way for the majority of people to thrive. Opportunity is quite scarce. Mm -hmm. So we need to make opportunities for ourselves. However, these opportunities have been criminalized. And I think this is where it's important to talk about why it's been done and the historical reasons behind that, tying that to slavery, tying that to colonialism. Um, why that's okay, but people can drink whiskey and drive their car through a crowd of people and kill, that, that's okay. Not okay, but the substance is legalized, but, but, but ganja is not. Um, so there, there's a lot that's there. And I think also criminalizing these young men, saying that there's no contribution we talk about how people don't have any dedication, hard work, determination, um, attention to detail. I spent a lot of time with um, the, these young men, also older farmers up in the hills in, in St. Lucia and St. Vincent. And 
it's not easy work. It's very difficult, challenging stuff. So I don't believe when I, you know, I, I pay attention to what's going on. Big business people in St. Lucia saying St. Lucians don't want to work. I don't believe that. I think it's just the opportunities that are there and people do not want to work to just be exploited where they can make enough money to get bus fare and go buy a soft drink and piece of bread to keep them alive. Like people want more and there's more within the system that they should be able to have. And that ties back to the wider discussion. I think that Nkrumah was talking about that we can look at individuals, but we have to look at the system where we're operating in. Um, because th these young men up in the hills, they're actually, I was doing the calculations through my research, they're one of the largest contributors to the, the economy in St. Lucia, more than bananas and remittances combined. Not more than tourism, but I think that's really significant. And if we want to have a discussion about this lost generation and these youths that are so troublesome, we need to we need to really have a serious conversation and look at some of the opportunities that they're finding in places that we do not consider to be uh, appropriate. But I think that's more on us and the way that of thinking that we we've been kind of cultivated within and and to um, broaden our horizons as to what we can do because they're showing us St. Lucians and Caribbean people can build economies. They can look after each other. I'm not saying it's perfect or romanticizing everything. I know that there's sometimes violence involved, but you can compare that with the other drug trade on the island, which is cocaine trafficking. It's totally different, right? And I think that that's where a lot of the problems come from. So I, I, I think that we can learn a lot if we actually talk to these young, young men in particular, because they, 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 they were the ones that told me this. Nothing that I'm saying is necessarily unique from, from my perspective. It was learning from them up in the hills. And I think that if we're serious about addressing these issues, we need to talk to them directly where they are to see um, what's wrong and why they've responded in the way that they have. Thanks so very much for that, uh, Kevin. That's a really, really important point that you're raising there. And we only have a, a couple of minutes to go before we actually take a break. But I just want to bring in Dr. Joseph uh, into that mix to get some feedback on uh, what Kevin just shared there. Uh, Dr. Joseph, is it a situation where we are not giving enough opportunities to these young black males as society? Or is it that we, we really are punishing them for being creative, for being innovative, and, and looking at the opportunities as they exist? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. When you I'm, I'm loving the discussion so far. I think it's taking a route that I think some Lutherans need to hear. I think when you analyze um, what, what we call opportunities for growth and development in any human in any human cycle it's easy to see what the bottleneck is in in the context of san lucia and i think when shelly was speaking he used the word post-secondary many times post-secondary post-secondary and i think a lot of the question has to do is what happens to young people male and female after secondary school there's a question there's something called hope and opportunity so you know you're going through life you're going to school up to that point, and think about it in, uh, across the board, in every sector. Think of your, 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 your footballer, your cricketer, your athlete. Up to, up to secondary school, that, that young person, I, don't really, I can't really say that person is denied hope or denied potential. The, the, the potential is not yet stymied. So I'm, I'm not saying that when you compare it on a global level that you have all of the facilities, all of the, all of the you know, the extra... Um, institutional mechanism that another person outside would have. We're not saying that because, of course, we are poor to the world country. I'm talking about in terms of that young person knowing that if I want to play cricket, I can play cricket. If I want to play football, I can play football. If I'm an athlete, I can, I, if I'm an, a bright young person, an academic, I love my books, I can do it up to secondary level. And, and after that, the question becomes, so that is where clearly to answer your question, that is what I think, of, that's the way I think our society is failing the young people. It is failing them in that. There is, there is a kind of hopelessness. And those of those you see who are successful are a ridiculously tiny minority. And when I say successful, I'm referring to the sportsmen and the academics. These are the two broad areas. The artists, sportsmen, and the academics. These Thanks very much for that, Dr. Joseph, because we're going to have to take a break. Uh, at this point in time, we're listening to Nation Beat. It's a special panel discussion, a series, in fact, on uh, emancipation for Emancipation 2024, collaboration between the Government Information Service and the Cultural Development Foundation. We'll be right back. Hello, OECS. Yo, OECS.
yes, this is your ocean. If I am to protect your future, we have to work together. It's the time to work together. If I am to help protect your future. Once I used to be so pure and clean And those hills were so fresh and green But now you see me as your dumping ground The current situation has me choking on your pollution Think hard about it, you will agree That really there is no you without me Make the zero waste pledge be responsible Cycle OECS, green actions, blue oceans. And welcome back to Nation Beat, our special series on emancipation, looking at issues surrounding emancipation. And our first in the series is the matter of looking at young black males. Uh, we've heard about the issues of marginalization, and we want to know how young black males are actually working to overcome this matter of the legacy of slavery and, of course, the issue of marginalization in the world that we live in today, and, of course, in specifically in St. Lucia. Now, we just had a very rich um, first um, segment where we looked at just broadly uh, the issue of marginalization, whether it's a reality, where we are failing, and Dr. Tennyson Joseph was just making the point of seems to be going good during the, uh, educa during the period of formal education, but seems to be falling off uh, pretty quickly and steeply after that. Uh, and Kruma, you are in fact are a practitioner in the education uh, sector. You're teaching, uh, albeit perhaps one may say at one of the uh, prestigious all male schools yes. and so perhaps you may not be seeing the the total gamut of of what the, the pressures are in terms of education for young black males right now but the point that was being made of course and i we just saw some results coming out of, of the cpea i mean largely speaking males and females were seemingly performing relatively well they were not there was not any major large gap mm. um that would be um, unusual, of course, because of the, I mean, the natural physiological differences of males and, and females at that age. So there is some difference there, but it didn't seem too bad. And then s what we're hearing is that somewhere along the line, there is that issue with young black males uh, underperforming. Is that what you're seeing? Is that what you're experiencing? Okay, well, as you said, I would have the limitation of where I operate. Um, but I think um, within the education system, Again, we'd, we'd have to look at the statistics in terms of even the breakdown in persons enter secondary school. Um, where do, you know, what's the, what's the skew in terms of the females, males? Um, and then when you get to CXC level, likewise, where that exists. But the point you're making, um, I, I want to identify with it. You may have to look at other things where you look at the education system. Um, I think it was Chevy who mentioned the ideas of success that we have. So that is something worth looking at. Um, are we actually being successful within the education system? Um, does the education system conceal, you know, certain class differences and certain biases within the society as well? We've recently, um, the government spoke of quail, and that is something that was, you know, just blatantly discriminated from the start of the education system. What have been the effects of that? You know, if you're looking at English competency as being the basis through which you can successfully go through the system, then, then that's definitely something to consider. What are the effects that have been had before in terms of your, your ability to, to navigate the education system? Um, even biases that teachers may have in terms of dealing with students, um, judging, maybe judging your competence, you know, based on your language, you know, and then there also the, the factors weighing down on your ability to perform in terms of, you know, economic resources, you know, mm -hmm. economic resources, availability of family. I, I remember some, some years ago, um, uh, 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 I think the Minister of Government was making the, talking about the, the, the issue of presence of family, etc., etc. Um, Dr. Is it Dr. Edmonds? 
Dr. Edmund spoke a while ago about, you know, the different sectors of the economy. We depend heavily on tourism, which impacts people's ability to actually support their children. So all of these things, I think, are legacies of that, of that time. Um, I cannot really speak too confidently with regard to, you know, how these things actually play, the skew, etc. But I do think that they have a major impact. Um, so just to look at the performance, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and whether that is actually a metric of are we being successful? What are the types of individuals, you know, that we are actually producing um, in terms of self-image, in terms of how they view the country, how they view the rule in the country, whether they believe they even have any obligation to the society at the end of the day. So all of these things have to kind of factor into that. Thanks so very much for that, Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joseph, I, I know you just had you, but I, I want you to zone in on the issue of whether the education system is fit for purpose for young black males in particular. Uh, and, and I'm thinking especially the issue of skills development. Uh, we, we seem to, perhaps only now, we're, we're talking a lot more about um, TVET and um, trying to inculcate that. But given those giving males that opportunity, the skills that they need to go beyond that secondary level um, education. Is that happening? I mean, are we, these, have we, have we, have we kept that uh, very colonial type of education system that's, you know, driven more about, about, about the, the academia than necessarily the skills? Yeah, so, so it's a complex question. My I, I short answer to you would be, would be no. The education system has not um, lived up to the expectations of the young people. And I will explain why. So education is a twofold process. It's not just skills. Skills are, skills are just um, like, you know, you can, you can teach a dog tricks, you know. You can teach, you can teach, you can teach a dog tricks. Uh, that, so that's, that's, these are skills. But, you can, but it's also something called consciousness. So the two, things go, the two things go together. You may have a very educated lawyer. But that lawyer has no sense of community. That lawyer is a thief. That lawyer is just about mm -hmm. making money. And you see it in certain lifestyles too. There is no broader commitment to society. So what I'm talking about, they're not skills. A lawyer is, a lawyer, the lawyer might be, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on lawyers. I'm just giving that as an example. The lawyer might be trained in relation to the law and knowing which sections to put and so forth. You can't be the lawyer on that. But then in terms of what is my role to the society? I came from a poor family. I have my family is not just my mother, my father. Um, my family is a whole community. I, 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 the, the example, one of the examples most striking to me are those students who go and do medicine in Cuba. And I always say, for example, you know, you went to Cuba and did a degree in medicine, and you come back as a, as a medical doctor. You know, the people who gave you that education in Cuba are facing an embargo for over 50 years, mm -hmm. making certain kinds of sacrifices. And when you come back to St. Lucia, what do you do? You, you mean that there's nothing in you that tells you. Well, you got a particular education from, from some real historical forces. It wasn't, it wasn't your good luck. It was, I said, there was something called Cuba that gave you an education. So when you come back to St. Lucia, if I'm from Chozel, for example, am I not to open a little clinic every Wednesday afternoon from, from 2 to 8 in the evening, you know, to let the, 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 the old ladies and things? So these are kind of, that, what am I talking about there? These are not skills. These are, that has to do with political, that has to do with a broader consciousness a broader moral consciousness but i want to answer your question directly so in a strict sense of in a strict sense of skills clearly the people are now young people are the creatives what do we do for them the sports persons that not everybody is academically inclined so what what the point that edmunds was making i think is very clear what are the activities that people are engaged in and how does the state in, in all of its institutional makeup its rules its regulations so what do they do for the tourism industry, for example? What are the rules that govern the regulations that make for tourism? To make a set of hoteliers rich. You pay for airlines for them. You build airport infrastructure. You teach people to smile for the tourists. There's a whole institutional... It is not by accident, you know. You decide that tourism is what you are going to place your emphasis on. And all government rules and regulations, taxations, concessions go to that. So all we are asking is then look at young people and what do we can we can can we not do a similar thing for them? So what are my skills? Am I a am I a musician? How do I make we are but we are musicians? The most creative people in the world are Caribbean people, dancers, artists. Nobody can question that. 
you, we are the most creative people in the world. And, and even at the point that, um, so therefore, what are the institutional mechanisms you are putting in place to ensure that the, the person who is the artist, the painter, gets to become a global artist, a global painter, which is what they are in terms of their the skills, the talent level. They are not small people. These are big global people. The Caribbean have produced global intellectuals, global artists, global musicians, global um, sports persons. So what are the institutional mechanisms? So the same effort you put towards tourism and the same effort you put towards bananas, you can put it towards youth development and the talents and, 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 and so forth. So, so the short answer to your question clearly is no. It has to do with priorities and how you analyze what is important, who are the class forces that you represent, who, who's, who are the class forces that you are working for and on behalf of. So what we do in the end, we bring police and things to jail the young people but we don't do it at the other end which is to give them institutional opportunities and mechanisms and so forth to to to, to truly develop their full potential Doc, thanks very much for that uh dr joseph uh edmonds uh, dr edmonds i'm sure you probably agree a lot with what is being said by uh dr joseph and and Nkrumah lucien a hundred percent i think that the points that are being made about the government does have an important role to play and they they do have power because we see that they can they can make their priorities so i think what dr joseph is saying about tourism and the concessions and making it easier for already successful wealthy well-resourced individuals to become even more so um that can that can be shifted um i realize we need an economic base in saint lucia and for now it is tourism but there's no reason that you can't do the same thing to say that we're going to build a network of cooperatives so that all of the almost all of the food that these resorts use we are going to build a supply chain for them a commodity chain that so small farmers transporters uh people at boxing plant anything like that they can have jobs as well because we're going to prioritize that but we don't so i i think that there's this overall mentality that has not changed and looking often at young black males as the problem in society i think in a lot of ways they're mirrors of the issues in society because the example of the lawyer i think is a really good one because they they might not have necessarily the community um engagement that we would like to see or or a respect or connection to them because they've made it they're gone you can leave you make money you step on people as you become powerful and in in society in general we celebrate that because that's looked at as a way to achieve success where you know we know that the person that is too generous with their time to give everything away they're never gonna really become in th this kind of role model i i think they're a role model they're very important but we we disregard that so i think in the society the values and our priorities are really important and we can't blame them young black men in particular when the the people that we hold up within St. Lucia but also more generally through social media and what they see in the United States and in Europe we're celebrating that so so they're getting a confused messaging because we're not saying that you are important as you are going back to Nkrumah's point about Creole the history that we teach them it's not about St. Lucians or Caribbean people or African people having anything of significance when it's divorced from Europe, right? So talking about Haiti or talking about the African continent in, in negative senses, the way that we teach it to people. I, was, I, I worked with Chevy for, for a number of years and something I always do to students the second, second week of class, I tell them about the kingdom of uh, Congo, city of Benin, prior to colonization what these places achieved and how once Europeans found out about them they actually remarked that they were incredible but not long later they were destroyed and we don't learn this history so so I, I don't blame these young men that they grow up in this kind of void and wondering of self-doubt a lack of self-respect um, for each other um, it's, it's, it's a really big issue but education can play a, a much bigger part in that and the government even though it has a lack of resources must 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 do more and they can do more thanks very much for that uh dr edmonds 
Now, Dr. Joseph, you were making that very important point, of course, about grounding of education. It has to have a soul uh, and a, a raison d'etre. Now, I think, uh, of course, Chevy, you, you teach uh, black and uh, African diaspora studies. That aspect of the grounding of our national education system, I mean, I've, I've heard, of course, of certain pronouncements regarding the teaching of African history and Caribbean history uh, in schools in St. Lucia. Uh, I'm sure you probably agree that this is long in coming. Yes, um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for the conversation. I'm just, I'm learning a lot from all the contributions um, that, that have been made so far. And to answer your question, most definitely, um, and I, I want to answer each question. I'm trying my best to answer each question by locating myself because I grew up in Marshall Boulevard. I'm, I'm saying this again, I grew up in Marshall Boulevard and Baratza, right? So, and what helped me was the conversation, the grounding conversation, the reasonings I used to have with Rastafarian elders in my community, particularly in Barata, when I moved to Barata. And I'm saying that because they introduced me to um, the history of Caribbean people, Black Caribbean people in particular, and also, um, Kevin, you mentioned about some of those ancient civilizations on the African continent. And, and, and thirdly, I remember I took a very interesting course with Dr. Tennyson in, at, at UWE on, on, on the governance of ancient Egypt. The, all those factors played a crucial role in my consciousness. And I'm saying this to say, I think that in my teaching, I try to apply those histories and those mechanisms on, on how I engage students, right? But for this conversation, I'm going to focus more on black, black men. Even in my classes, they, they don't have many um, young, young black students, male black students in particular. And one way I try to engage them or talk to them or bring them in is to talk about that wealthy history. Right, and not in this romanticized way, but first by establishing the fact that first we are human because they try to dehumanize us through transatlantic slavery, and secondly to talk about what we have done and what we can be. Right, so even was as, as I, I was listening to everyone and, and Kruma made the point in where he's located, I always throw in Enchipo Secondary School intentionally because even when we talk about the hierarchy of um of secondary schools in St. Lucia, which schools get more priority, etc. When um, um, Nkrumah mentioned St. Mary's College, I saw a little smile and, and tell us Joseph, Joseph is because I know he's a, 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 son, a son from that institution, which is school. So then I want to push that question to Nkrumah, actually. Um, I, I really want to know, because in my time in Entrebo Secondary School, yes, I learned about the history of Africa to a certain extent, how we will talk about the Amerindians, the Caribs, the Arawaks, now the Kalinagos and Tainos. That played a major role for me in my educational component and bringing, bringing in self. So to answer your question, I, I believe that could definitely help young black men in St. Lucia and the Caribbean to a wider extent. But I really want to know how it's being taught in the Caribbean. Because for me, I've seen, not, I'm not necessarily talking about my Caribbean experience. When we talk about Africa, it's always separated from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Right? So I love us to bring it in and to see it as a form of empowerment, not as a form just to romanticize. So Nkuma, I know I'm not the one who's ask, asking questions, but to mm -hmm. respond, I really love to know how it's been taught. And I, I, I know you for some time now as a grassroots individual, right? Those grounding sessions, the reasoning sessions we tend to have in different capacities. How are those things being taught in the school and how you're engaging young black men? I just wanted to put that there. Thanks. Well, we are in fact going to um, get Increment to answer that question just after the break because we're actually due for one at this point, our final break. And uh, it's going to be a great way to enter that final session. We'll be right back. Thank you. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development is placing heavy emphasis on the concept of food security. It's our prosperity, our future. There are business opportunities in fisheries and aquaculture. If you are involved in this sector or you are a member of the Fishers Cooperative, you are entitled to rebate on fuel consumed. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security and Rural Development also provides technical support and training as well as juvenile fish for aquaculture or aquaponic farmers. If you are interested in business opportunities in fisheries and aquaculture, you can contact the Chief Fisheries Officer at 468-4135 for further details. 
Welcome back to Nation Meet, a special series on emancipation for 2024, a collaboration between the Cultural Development Foundation and the Government Information Service. And we have a wonderful panel, uh, Dr. Tennyson, Joseph, Dr. Chevy, Eugene, Mr. Nkrumah, Lucien, as well as Kevin Edmonds. And of course, uh, some of our members are virtual, but Nkrumah is right here on the ground uh, teaching at St. Mary's College. And that question, of course, uh, being posed by uh, Dr. Eugene your experience in actually teaching history right now, okay. uh, I suspect you go above board in terms of what maybe the ordinary history teacher might even be mm. providing. Okay. I just want to dive with a little bit to touch on something that Dr. Yes. Uh, Joseph mentioned about being academically inclined. I always resist that a bit because I don't think um, the way in which we persons currently navigate the education system, I don't know if we're in a position to say you know that this one is and that one is not right and there's a further implication to that in terms of the teaching of history because because of those subjects require reading you find that in um schools that are that that lower performing students enter some of these schools don't do history they don't do history you know so <laughs> it it again points to you know the the education that we are serving persons right. of this so rather than why are those students, how are we addressing those students' ability to navigate the system? We're saying, hey, because you are not performing at this level, you don't need to and go learn a skill. As if learning a skill does not also require you to have a certain level of awareness of your society, of history, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to go to Chevy's um, question. Um, the history syllabus is very, um, it's very packed. There's a lot in there. So, um, Normally, you would do. We have a. We don't really use a, a, a lower school syllabus, but we there's, we are guided by, you know, the text, etc. And we create um, unit plans, etc. Based on that. Um, some years ago, there was a, a review, a book review, and the book that was put in place actually touches on um, ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, even the CXC syllabus does include. Um, studies of Africa, West Africa, um, India, to some extent. But you have to look at, you know, the, 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 the time, etc. You know, the, 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 the level of emphasis that is in it and mm -hmm. how much time you actually have to cover those things. It doesn't allow you to deal with it in, in, in such depth as it should be. You know, so, so that is the issue with it. Um, yeah, I'll stop. So I'm hearing yeah. from you, basically, mm -hmm. history should be mandatory. For everybody um not necessarily okay. up to the, the 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 cxc level but certainly i think person should have access to the lower lower school. i think person should have access to to history it affects not only people often think of history as a study of the past history is actually you could say a study of the present informed by that information of the past mm -hmm. so you so when persons don't have access to those things even their ability to analyze very basic things in the present is very limited mm -hmm. you know um to explain experiences that they have we, we started up the discussion speaking about, you know, deviance, etc. In, within the society. If persons are experiencing the forces of that legacy and are unable to actually make the connection of what is going on, mm -hmm. then, they, then, then you will find that persons will rebel based on just what they respond to, just what they are experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so definitely requires a lot more, you know, access to history, African history, wider world history. And it should not, persons should not be deprived of, of those things based on their already challenging experience navigating the education system. Mm -hmm. I, thanks so very much for that, uh, of course, Nkrumah. I think it was Kevin who was mentioning the, the, some of the biases that people still seem to have when it comes to um, people of African descent across the world. I, and I think you were mentioning Haiti, for instance. Uh, Kevin, I want to come to you and, of course, maybe also to Chevy. That whole